Hello and welcome to season three of the Turn by Turn podcast. I am here. I am Daniel. I am joined with Chris, who is still here as well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And that's still my name. <laughs> <laughs> he will not be Kevin this season after all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we abandoned those plans. So it is now season three, and season three is going to be a little different in a couple of ways that we'll cover right here and probably in other spaces more. So in our second season, we added in indie dev game interviews where Chris and I or I, me or just Chris would interview a dev, and that would be our every other episode. We decided that to kind of make more sense of people looking for Fire Emblem, Pokemon, uh, Golden Sun stuff, that we'd keep turn by turn as our RPG podcast. And then we'd sort of spin off to a new podcast called Game Dev Hideout, where it'll be your same wonderful hosts, me and Chris, talking with game devs still. So we have a bunch of those lined up, and we're pretty excited to get that going. But that will be on a separate channel from the turn by turn channel but it's all your same zany turn by turn action <laughs> and um we'll be talking with more game devs than just like turn based games so we'll have platformers and weird 3d things and deck stuff and all kinds of different devs from all across the board so we hope you'll join us over there as well um, and the reason for the change really is just to make sure that uh, we're not flooding your inbox with things that you don't want. If you want both, you can get both. If you want one or the other, you can get one or the other. It's all about, uh, we are here to serve you. So that's that's why we do it. But you should totally get both. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the show, uh, Game Dev Hideout, will be everywhere that Turn by Turn already is. So it'll It'll run in similar circles because it's, it's it's us so <laughs> yeah yeah we still know all the same people still working with all the same people not too much has changed yeah we have a bunch of new devs we're excited to introduce everybody to and you may already even know some of them so it's going to be pretty exciting we're going to dig deeper into games and learn even more about game dev and the indie scene that's developing so we're really excited for that but we're also yep. excited to keep going with Fire Emblem and Golden Sun and Earthbound and Pokemon. I feel like the way Pokemon releases now, um, we'll have more Pokemon episodes than we know what to do with. Because their yeah. release slate is like insane right now. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Um, and I wanted to make sure I said too, the most important thing about the spinoff show is that uh, if you've already gotten the name Turn by Turn tattooed on you, don't worry, that will still be honored. Exactly. <laughs> You just like your one bicep has turn by turn. The other bicep can have game dev hideout. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Right below your mom tattoo or whatever, whatever else might be there. <laughs> whatever else is close to your heart like we are. Exactly. So we wanted to um, answer some like listener feedback that we've gotten, which is not something that we've done since our show has started because we didn't have a super huge amount. I mean, to be to be fair, I want to give myself credit there. We did. It just got edited out a little bit. So we're going to do it again. <laughs> exactly. I think um, we did some in our Pokemon Arceus, Legends Arceus episode. And the episode got so long with Pokemon Arceus stuff that we just like didn't didn't really fit in. So we have tried, but now we're trying again and we have a little more. So hopefully... That will, <laughs> our, our, we can accept forgiveness. <laughs> but we love to hear from you guys, so it's always exciting when people reach out. So uh, in no particular order, um, on our, our RPGs Too Long episode, we had um, someone on Facebook reach out, um, Autumn Ada Kronquist, which if I'm butchering your name, I apologize. I'm not very good at pronouncing things. In regard to our RPGs too long, they wrote trail series with like a word with you. And I thought this was interesting because I didn't know I haven't played a trails game yet. Have I've you, not you, either. You have not either. So that is our gaming blind spot then. So, it is. They they look good. So it's definitely what I've been tempted to do. So 
definitely will have to check those out. And um, they were actually nice enough to like kind of give me a summary of the series and kind of where to start. So I think there's a lot of people that really dig these games. I don't I don't think I've been like willfully trying to not play one. I just it hasn't come up that I've had the option to. So I'm definitely interested to learn more about it. Where where were we told to start? We were told to start um, Trails in the Sky is the like the first game that was released. But um, they were recommending that we start with. Um, oh, they were recommending that we start with Trails in the Sky as your first game because it introduces a lot of the lore that builds up in other games. Sweet, and I love I love hearing from these fans of like these giant RPG franchises that I just, just don't hear about very often. Um, I think it was only just recently. Um, there's a series called Yes, which is spelled like Y S. Oh, that's. I, a- I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, like I think the ninth one came out or something. And I saw all these people randomly in my feed being like, oh, I love Yes. I'm so excited for Nine or something. And I'm like, who are you people? Where did you come from? But it's great. <laughs> I love it. But I'm so excited that people get so excited. I'm so happy for you. What else? Uh, what else do we got in the mailbag? All right. On our Lord of the Rings, the Third Age episode, we had a Devin Carlson say, I wish they could remaster this game. I still try to play it occasionally on my GameCube, but over time it gets glitchy and hard to see. And like, if they wanted to do a Switch port of the Third Age, which I imagine probably isn't a super high priority, I would be so down. (laughs) Yeah, I would would replay it, though. I would want it released on two Switch cards. Yeah, just (laughs) for the novelty of it. (laughs) Despite it probably being able to fit on like half a Switch card at this point. (laughs) Oh yeah, for sure. (laughs) Yeah, it would definitely be up for a remaster of that game. Uh, I wouldn't want them to change like anything. Just just remaster it and maybe fix uh, some of those things like camera controls or things like that that maybe didn't age quite so well. I haven't played my GameCube in a long time, so I'm not sure if it's like in the process of dying or if it's fully gone. But um, I definitely have a lot of love for that game, and I think that it would age pretty well. If uh, if Amazon's Lord of the Rings Lord of the Rings show flops, that can be their backup plan. Maybe I know we, we can recoup on costs by doing a quick remaster of Third Age. Quick, quick port it, switch port for the Third Age. <laughs> <laughs> um, then on our Chrono Trigger episode, we had a few people um, reach out about um, Chrono Trigger being their favorite game of all time, and. Um, how Magnus, Magus, Magnus, Magus, is it Magnus? I, I don't know, Ma- Magus. Uh, for my playthrough, if you listen to that episode, I actually did not get him. He never joined <laughs> me, so I never learned too much about him. So Christopher Quint was saying, Magus is so OP too. <laughs> Wouldn't know. <laughs> I, I did something wrong there. <laughs> then we had... um james cook saying uh golden sun has some of the best dungeon design in jrpgs i could i could see that being the case uh crystal hasn't played it i don't think so i have not but uh i'm working on my youtube channel playing through like all the shining games and uh camelot was big in the shining games development and they are also the ones that made golden sun so i'm definitely thinking that at some point i might do golden sun on the channel and you know broadcast my first time playing it (laughs) <laughs> it'd be a good game for that so let's see what else we have here in the we had um friend of the show the sinister design channel on youtube who is uh craig from our telepath tactics episode um agreeing that shining force 3 localized would be amazing and then he also says the funny thing about fire emblem fates is that while the story is absolute unmitigated trash as some of the best mechanics and con and Conquest specifically has some of the best map design in the whole series. So I'm I'm not sure about that. Everybody says that. But <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to wait for Daniel to to play Fates and then we'll we, we might make a thing out of it and I'll go back and I might have to contest that. We'll see cuz <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. For fra- frame of reference, I've just started playing Awakening. <laughs> so which, which is a good place to to do to be before fates i think i think that um awakening sets up a lot of things that you can appreciate in fates and uh even later installments 
So I'm excited to keep playing it. Um, time, like interdimensional travel and different timeline characters showing up is sometimes something I don't particularly care for. So we'll we'll see how I do with it. But um, SRPG mechanics tend to be enough to get me to stick around. So <laughs> I'll probably be there with bells on or what, however that expression goes. <laughs> I feel like old people say that, but I work with old people, so I'm allowed to use some like old euphemisms and things. <laughs> um, another thing um, Craig had commented on on our uh, Radiant Dawn episode was um, he liked your point about um, characters not just waiting around like for plot to happen between Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn. Their lives continue and their paths divulge and go in separate routes and um he was wishing that that had been done more in three houses yes i am finally to i I know it's taking me forever but i'm finally past the time skip in my second playthrough of three houses um and yeah i would definitely agree with that that uh it does feel like everyone's just kind of waiting around for you to do things so in three houses you have like a time skip where they're just like, well, I think he's alive or she's alive or whatever Byleth you're playing with is alive. So I think I'll just like hang out, you know, like coast for five years. Like, okay, now this has significant. Okay, yeah, this will be in the three houses. Oops. <laughs> so, um, all right, to cut, to cut a long rant short. Um, yes, Craig, I do wish that would have happened in three houses. <laughs> 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 season four will just be 12 episodes on three houses <laughs> no but i'm not opposed to doing uh i was gonna say four but now three hopes is coming would you guys be upset i okay i this is something i want listener feedback on three hopes has not come out it comes out in a few days uh in when we're recording this to date this a little bit would you guys be upset for season four if we did like an episode per route of three houses and three hopes. So it was like seven episodes minimum. (laughs) That sounds insane. That game is long, man. And we're just, we're literally going to add three more routes to it in a couple days. And maybe there might be eight paths through this game with different characters and different storylines. So like, I don't know. All I'm saying is you're not going to get that from other, other podcasts or other shows. I know the the massive deep dive, <laughs> but it, if you think about it, and I think the reason that it would be sort of a decent podcast topic is that you're dealing with nine pretty developed characters, like nine ish characters per route. There's a lot of story and each character has things about them and like the things about them affect how they level up and like what they like. And I think discussing that could be interesting in a, the podcast format. Yes, it it could be a whole thing. Maybe maybe that needs to be a sub season or something. We do the three houses, uh, interlude. <laughs> yeah, the interlude or something. I don't know. I got thoughts, man, and I got I, I'm writing a massive notes page uh, to to contain them all, so I know when to bring things up. <laughs> so to continue on with our listener feedback, um, B Train Studio, who is Brandon, actually one of the other one of the devs we spoke to of. Gray Heritage, um, he commented on our Sacred Stones episode, my favorite character is Dussel, Loot, and Joshua is a close second, though. I mainly like Dussel's theme on loyalty to his land. The support with Ephraim explained that fighting for a better future is still loyalty, despite him being an enemy to his land. Gameplay-wise, though, Loot is my favorite. Way too much fun downing the monsters on her on her chapter. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dussel's a great character. Dussel, however you say it. I always get it wrong. Um, and I love Joshua, too, but that's just the partially because I love dodge tanks in games. But yeah, I, I really like those themes, too, uh, about fighting for a better future and stuff. And um, I forget who said it. I was listening to like a speech at one point, and uh, the speaker had the point that was like, sometimes the best way to be patriotic is to want better for your home. It's It's not about blindly loving everything about where you're from sometimes it's about wanting better and i I thought that was really cool Mm -hmm. i would agree with that um i think i at the point in the game i did i lost him so i didn't get to really use him too too much on my playthrough 
All right, I'm going to be the voice for the listeners real quick. How did you manage to lose Dussel? <laughs> <laughs> he is the only, like, I think I said in the episode, remember. he is the only character in, I think, a Fire Emblem game so far that by, from the point he joins you, he can do a round of combat with the final boss and not die. He is, like, one of the bulkiest characters in that entire franchise. I think what happened, and I think I went back and changed it, like, I made sure I had him. Because you have to remember, I play with the the permanent death. So when I did that fight, I had three characters. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, Sacred Stones, you have to, but you're saying you don't reset. Yeah, I, I didn't. I started resetting, like, in the later half of that game. But for that <laughs> battle, I had basically Seth, Erica, and one other unit, one other tank for that battle. So when Ephraim and Dussel and uh, there's a, a, uh, a mage or something that comes with them, when they show up, like I had nothing to defend them with. I like see. I had nothing to defend the main squad with, let alone the B team. <laughs> so like... <laughs> I forget that you Iron Man all these games because you're like way more hardcore than I am. <laughs> Which is like very strange given that you're like so more, much more attuned with, with games than I am. But um, I did several battles in that game with just like a couple of units and they took forever. Uh, yeah. Like 45 against like three, three or four characters. So I eventually started. Re- that's the one where I started to like my heart grew 10 sizes that day and I decided that I would keep them alive, but <laughs> it was pretty brutal <laughs> up to that point. Yeah, I can imagine. So let's do one more listener feedback, which is also about um, Chrono Trigger, but it's from a, someone else in the 6-5 family, so I want to read it as well. So TC's Big Head, who is um, one of the hosts of... Oh, the name's totally blanking on me right now. On the Studio Demands It podcast commented that hands down chrono trigger was his favorite game ever and um that's a really great one of my favorite podcasts they um they take um listener feedback and turn it into movies so people will request like harry potter 17 and they have to have daniel radcliffe reprise his role and they they get little like conditions that they have to like sculpt movie scripts out of like weird ideas so it would be like, uh, it's got to have Daniel Radcliffe in it. There's got to be a tank somewhere. And uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's one more thing that would be thrown in. There's got to be a talking shark at some point. Yeah, exactly. And then they'll, they'll like spend like an hour, hour and a half crafting a script out of whatever conditions they're given. Yeah. So that was our listener feedback for our first couple of seasons. Um, we'd love it if you drop us comments and leave us things to talk about. And uh, for this season, I think we're going to try to incorporate more questions and like try to get people more involved. We can do more listener feedback episodes and stuff to to engage with you guys more as listeners. Yeah, or just put it as part of regular episodes. I have no idea, but I'd definitely love to hear from you guys more, too. You can tell me how wrong I am about certain things and I will love it. (laughs) (laughs) The discussion is half the fun. So, yeah, send send us comments. (laughs) <laughs> yes it is but uh i think that means it's time for the break and to get to the other half of this episode which uh is a, a pretty historically significant game the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy text rpg right so after our break we will dig into that bye be back soon Hey, this is TC. And this is Jim from the Studio Demands It podcast. Where every episode we take a demand from a hypothetical studio. Which could be you. And challenge ourselves to conceptualize, pitch, and craft a film based on the stipulations. Or the demands. We are given. We talk about movies all the time. Particularly, we complain about the choices made in the films we've seen. We're nerds like that. And, of course, like any good nerd does, we automatically assume that we could do better. Even with the demands and restrictions that clearly must have been put on by a production. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com and listen to our previous library of episodes. Our library of previous episodes. Our precious library, Jim. (laughs) Our library of precious episodes.
You're a pirate Smeagol. <laughs> uh, okay. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com to listen to our library of episodes. And submit your demand for a future episode, too. So go do that. Okay, bye. Okay, end of ad. Has this ever happened to you? Ah, this video game is bullshit! Are you tired of gaping plot holes in boring gameplay mechanics? Look, all I'm saying is that if a full-fledged Krogan is falling off a platform, there's no way Commander Shepard has the upper arm strength to pull him up! Has reading become just too tedious of a chore? Ugh, books. Are you bored of your same three murder podcasts? Shocking, it's the butler. Allow me to introduce you to the brand new fan fiction podcast, with an X, hosted by our lovely basement dwelling and real life Muppet, Dan McCoy. Well, that's hurtful. And myself, of course, the blonde bombshell with the blood of Odin and the great looks of Jake Busey from Starship Troopers. That's accurate. And with our powers combined. No. Oh, you never let me do what I want to do. I said no, man. We're not doing that. Ah, fine. Anyway, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your fix from. Remember, fan fiction with an X. Hello and welcome back from the break. I'm so glad you decided to stick around. You should definitely check out the shows that those commercials were for. So, uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Game. Um, I'd like to start with, uh, what is your experience with this series, Daniel? Have you seen the movie, read the books, anything like that? I'm not familiar with this, so when you suggested it, I was kind of completely in the dark. I, I've i gotten the sense from friends and people talking about it that it's it's kind of like quirky sci-fi, almost sort of Monty Python, but sci-fi. Is that kind of... Yes. Yeah, that is exactly what I would describe it as. Um, I have not read the book, uh, but I've watched the movie. I know that's not a substitute. Um, and I actually have a little bit of history with this game. Uh, when I was really, really young, I have an older cousin, Carla, that showed me this game. Um, and I thought it was cool that you could play it in browser, you could play it anywhere, because it's such a small game by today's standards. And uh, we had a lot of fun playing that together back in the day and not making it very far. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a background about the, the game, just so uh, we can kind of talk about that. So... The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game was originally released in 1984 for the slew of consoles and home computers that I'm about to read. Uh, the Apple II, the Macintosh, the Commodore 64, MS-DOS, the Amiga, Atari 8-bit, Atari ST, and Control Program for Microcomputers. Wow, has our uh, console naming come a long way. <laughs> Except for Xbox. I still don't know what the newest Xbox is even called. Have you ever even played on any of those, Daniel? Uh, I believe growing up, the first computer that we had was a Commodore 64. And the extent of it, if I'm even remembering it remotely correctly, was we had some sort of game revolving the Muppets. I have some memory of a very old computer playing some strange Muppet game. <laughs> and then I have another memory of being able to make a red ball bounce. Sweet. I uh, never owned any of these, but at the video game museum I went to, they had a Commodore 64 that I was playing on. And I can't remember what I was playing, but it was something something else text-based. I know that. Um, so the, the game, the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game, was designed by series creator Douglas Adams, which is awesome because I, I feel like very rarely do you have uh, the... Uh, main person the main creative force behind uh, a giant franchise working hand you know hands-on with the game which i thought was super cool and uh, he was aided by steve moretzky uh from the company infocom which also published the game eventually um steve moretzky was known for his uh, zork series of choose your own adventure books uh, which Infocom was also adapting to video games. Um, and I thought it was weird when I was doing background research on him that he also worked on a canceled Warcraft game um, in 1998 called Warcraft Adventures Lord of the Clans, which would have taken place after Warcraft 2. I thought that was a really neat little thing that I had no idea there were even spinoffs planned. Um, he seemed to be really intera uh, into interactive fiction as a genre, uh, just text-based adventure and choose-your-own-adventure books. Um, and one of the uh, other titles that stuck out to me, he developed for Activision back in the day, and that was called Leather Goddesses of Phobos 2, 
Gas Pump Girls Meet the Pulsating Inconvenience from Planet X. <laughs> if you want an episode on that, l- drop a comment. <laughs> uh, that was an adult point and click game. Oh, never mind. We don't generally cover <laughs> adult games. <laughs> When I read that, I was like, that is one of the best names I've ever heard of for anything. Talk about long titles. Woo. And talk about one of the perfect guys to work on something uh, that is supposed to be a snarky, humorous sci-fi adventure. Um, but anyway, back to Hitchhiker's Guide. This was one of the most successful games of its time. It sold 400,000 copies by the time they stopped counting. It actually came with a bunch of goodies back in the day that Infocom called feelies. Um, which were included with many of their titles. Uh, have you seen any of these? Did you look at this? I did not see this, no. Okay, so Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy came with a pin-on button with Don't Panic printed in large friendly letters. Um, I'm assuming these descriptions, uh, these descriptions are pulled from the actual package. Um, a small pa- plastic packet containing pocket fluff, which is a uh, item you need in the video game, and uh, that is a cotton ball. In order for the destruction of Arthur Dent's house, the main character, uh, in order for the destruction of Earth, written in Vogon, which is actually also written in an English cryptogram, uh, and it's using the Greek alphabet, uh, the Greek alphabet just slightly changed, um, and it's nearly identical to the uh, destruction for Arthur's house. Um, It came with the official microscopic space fleet, um, which is an empty plastic bag. (laughs) Because it's microscopic. Um, Peril-sensitive sunglasses, which was a pair of opaque black cardboard sunglasses. Um, How many times has this happened to you? An advertising brochure for the fictional guidebook or encyclopedia, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And finally, uh, another item from the game, no tea. Just like the professional, uh, the tea that professional hitchhikers do not carry. And uh, that was, uh, in fact, nothing in the box. It just wasn't in there because it's not an item. It's not a thing. Um, So the game, when you get to the gameplay, the game is mostly based on the first book in the series and starts with your main character, Arthur Dent, waking up at home in bed. So my question for you, Daniel, here is how long did it take you to get out of bed and get the lights on? So I'm kind of annoying with words in that I had absolutely no clue what I was supposed to be doing. So I knew it was text-based, obviously. So it took me a while to figure out there was a light. I think I actually found out it was a light because it basically said, you could try turning on a light. (laughs) So um, a lot of stuff that I figured out was the game being sarcastically rude about me. And then um, another thing that stuck out was I would say like, walk forward and it'd say i don't know what forward is so then i'd say like walk north and then it'd be like you can't walk north so like i felt like i was getting stuck a lot my my word choice was different than the word choice they were using for the game so i kind of was like repeatedly shooting myself in the foot yes because your movements how many uh inputs you make actually does matter exactly so like being like i like to use a lot of words and very vocabulary and things so like i was feeling like i don't know if i was like just too outside the box or or what my kind of primary issue was i i think it's the text-based games sort of all use the same language or at least a lot of them do and if you're not versed in that world it's kind of hard to get uh acclimated to it um and a lot of games are that way you know if, if you're playing an mmo and i tell you well we need to kite the enemies and then because i'm the healer i'm gonna need you to peel for me and take aggro you'd be if you're not into mmos you'd be like you needed to do who with the what <laughs> So text-based ones kind of have their own lingo as well. And uh, it took me a while to figure out as well. But eventually I uh, started uh, talking to some people and was told, you can just use, if you need to go north, just type N. If you need to go east, type E. Oh, and really? you can just do those things. Yeah, it's, it's way easier than I was making it. Yeah, I think I was overcomplicating it by trying to be cute. Like, cute's probably not 100% the right word, but like cute about it. And then like, as I was getting like, I don't know this response, I was trying to get like wordier about it, thinking like, oh, maybe I was just too vague. So I'd be like, stand up and like put on the bathrobe and put the screwdriver in your pocket. And then it's like, it wants you to slow down. And like yeah. my normal mode of playing is like speed through stuff, but like puts you in your place by 
basically telling you slow down like yeah it'd be easy to put on your robe if you were standing idiot kind of (laughs) kind of thing yeah it's sort of every little basic thing is its own puzzle um i actually did this pretty quickly because like i said i did this with a cousin as a kid so I remembered that uh, I needed to turn on the lights. Um, I remember it being funny to me that if you say open your eyes, it goes, they are open. (laughs) I was just like, oh, like it has answers for even when you have the wrong answer, it has dialogue for that a lot of times. I thought that was very cool. And I think that like is definitely like intertwined with like the author's weird, like cynically, like start sarcastic humor peeking into the game where like you put in like a response that you think is necessary like oh well it's being super specific so i need to tell myself to open my eyes and then it's like well your eyes are already open like figure it out so un unlevel playing field be super specific but not that specific yeah, I remembered too that um, your character is hungover and you need to take a pill to help you. So I was like, oh, okay, I got I don't remember where the pill is though. So I tried looking in drawers and things. And then uh, it's like, I don't know the word drawer. And I was like, oh no, is it like some Britishism that I'm not familiar with? <laughs> Do I need, so I'm like, is it covered, looking covered? No, that's not it. I'm like, oh man, do y'all have something weird that you call cupboards? I don't know. (laughs) The Schiffer robe. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But eventually it was like, you know, oh, it's in my bathrobe over there, which I need to get. And so, uh, you know, I grab it and then it's like, okay, look in pocket. And it's like, well, that would be easier if you were wearing the robe. Okay, put on a robe. You, You put it on. Look in pocket. Here's what's in the pocket like oh okay but yeah i felt like like i was like this is taking me a while even with some foreknowledge of what to do i knew it would take daniel a while but yeah so you put on your robe and leave your house um to find a giant bulldozer about to destroy your house which obviously is a problem for the main character so yeah you do that you go to the bar and drink with your friend ford because he comes to tell you that that is not actually a problem that your house is going to be destroyed because the entire earth is about to be destroyed. So really, in the grand scheme of things, your house is very small. How far did you make it? I I didn't make it much further than the bar. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Did you take the sandwich? So these are the things that like, is there anything to indicate that you should do that? But this game is an old game and it's one of those that i feel like you know you when games didn't used to be so accessible you you had your games and they were what they were for very long amounts of time you just kind of had to figure these things out and i'm sure it helps too if you've read the actual novel but eventually you need to ask for a sandwich at the bar and not eat it you need to put it in your pocket and take it with you and on your way back up the hill to your house um which is destroyed while you're at the bar you feed it to a dog on the way and we'll come back to that. That dog is really important. So you go back up, up the way and uh, the Vogon fleet shows up to tell you that earth, uh, basically what Ford already told you, earth is about to be destroyed to uh, create a hyperspace bypass lane. Um, It's sort of like a satire on what we do to uh, animals, I guess. So to go back to production stuff for just a second, when I was a kid, This was 100% a text game. And now we have this fancy anniversary edition that adds pictures every so often. So how fancy is that? I would have not gotten nearly as far without the pictures. (laughs) Like if I was just looking at like a Word document with this same like text on it, I would not have gotten anywhere. Yeah, it definitely makes it a little bit easier. And so I did a little bit of research on that, but there wasn't a ton on the website um as far as i understand it the pictures were actually added by competition where fans sent in loads of pictures and the creators of this anniversary version used their their favorites and as far as i understand it they were so impressed they just made two versions of the game that incorporate different pictures so if you just can't get enough of the game you can replay it with different art so uh i made i made it off of earth by myself but then in the interest of time i used a guide because uh yeah it it's, it would take me months to figure all this out by myself. And uh, I did find it a little ironic. I'm using a guide to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So one of the earliest ones, too, that uh, is really difficult is in the hold of the Vogon ship. This puzzle's insane. And so much can go wrong. So it, this is a, apparently a notorious puzzle to the text-based game genre called the Babble Fish Puzzle. 
um, you have to use a bunch of specific items all in a row in a certain way. And it might be items that you've already missed. Um, and the worst part is, if you don't get it, you don't game over. You can get pretty far into the game, but the game is not actually beatable without a guide unless you correctly solve this puzzle and get this babblefish to help you translate things later. So I see I see you giving me a look. We talk a lot about like like efficiency with time in game like games and like choices in games. So it's like super interesting to to hear about something so like weirdly inefficient. Oh yeah, uh, and on purpose. So yeah. like the things you have to do, you have to have a satchel, you have to have taken the mail. When you leave your house at the very beginning of the game, there's a bunch of junk mail in a pile. You have to have taken that with you. You had to have that foresight because you might need that. You have to have a towel, like it's crazy. And you've got to use all these in very specific ways. And remember your amount of inputs matters. You can't just mess around with this for an endless amount of time. Eventually, you'll have to move on. And then uh, I don't know if they had saves back in the day. I, I couldn't quite find that. So I'm going to assume yes, but I'm not sure they even had saves. So you may have had to start from the beginning. But if you didn't have the mail, you would have to start from the beginning anyway. This became such a notorious puzzle in its day that Infocom actually started selling T-shirts that said, I got the babble fish. Um, and the author, Douglas Adams, said that this difficulty was intentional, uh, saying, just as the player gets comfortable in the narrow neck, the bottom drops out. I loved the sense of humor of this game. Uh, one of my favorite things was if you take too long or if you say too many things the game doesn't recognize, you get the war room scene, um, which I think Daniel probably got. I took a, a picture of it so I could read it to you uh, for those of you that... Uh, are not familiar with this game. So what I was trying to do is read a book um, because you get the guide. You get the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And so I was trying to read that. And uh, it says, It is, of course, no well known that careless talk costs lives, but the full scale of the problem is not always appreciated. For instance, at the exact moment you said, read book, and it's got like, you know, the note that I typed there, a freak wormhole opened in the fabric of the space-time continuum and carried your words far, far back in time across almost infinite reaches of space to a distant galaxy where strange and warlike beings were poised on the brink of frightful interstellar battle. The two opposing leaders were meeting for the last time. A dreadful silence fell across the conference table as the commander of the V-Hergs, resplendent in his black-jeweled battle short, gazed levelly at the Gugavunt leader squatting opposite him in a cloud of green, sweet-smelling steam. As a million sleek and horribly beweaponed star cruisers poised to unleash electric death at his single word of command, the Beherg challenged his vile enemy to take back what it had said about his mother. The creature stirred in its sickly, broiling vapor, and at that very moment, the words, read book, drifted across the conference table. Unfortunately, the Viherg tongue was the most in the Viherg tongue. This was the most dreadful insult imaginable, and there was nothing for it but to wage terrible war for centuries. Eventually, the error was detected, but over 250,000 worlds, their peoples and cultures perished in the terrible Holocaust. You have destroyed most of a small galaxy. Please pick your words with greater care. This is the attitude that the game hits you with. So I wasn't huge on this, as you can probably tell. <laughs> I, did my, I did my best, but the my favorite thing was um, the bulldozer killed me a lot, and I appreciated that there were these, like, not quite as long as that, but, like, sweeping narratives about how, like, your failure to protect your house, like, has, like, universal consequences because the bulldozer killed me multiple times because I kept laying in front of it thinking that that would be a good way to stop it. I mean, that is what you have to do for a minute. So you were on the right track. Yeah, so I, I died a lot and it was always like, you died and now like the world will not be good anymore. Kind of like... Oh, I, I got a different one. Sentences about your failure for dying, basically. I, I got a different one. Um, I got killed by, I think the house collapsed on me at one point because I was taking too long. And uh, it says, like, you expire in silence. And I was like, oh, okay, I created a save already, so I'll reload that save. So I typed save, which is not the correct input. You have to type restore. Um, so I typed save, and the game tells me, you keep out of this. You're dead. An ambulance arrives. And so I type okay, and it says, you keep out of this. You're dead and should be concentrating on developing a good firm rigor mortis. 
you are put in the ambulance, which drives away. And I said, no. And it says, for a dead person, you are talking too much. As the ambulance reaches the mortuary, a fleet of Vogon construction ships unexpectedly arrives and demolishes the Earth to make way for a new hyperspace bypass. <laughs> yes, I, I got that one as well. I, I tried really, I tried to play this a lot and I died a lot. And I sent Lou away a few times, uh, forward away. I basically just said hi and bye inadvertently. Like I, I played some serious amount of this trying to trying to yes. get it to work without uh, like going full full boil on hints and things. And uh, then, even even with guides, I had problems. At one point, you uh, have to listen to poetry, and to get the answer to a clue, you have to appreciate that poetry. So this this alien, this Vogon, starts reading poetry, and I say praise, and it says I don't know the word praise. So I type appreciate, and it says what do you want to appreciate? And I said poem. And it goes, if you want to enjoy the poetry, just type that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, thanks. It's not usual usual to say the most fun I had in the game was dying, but that's definitely the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely is fun. Um, I'm not going to explain the whole game, but I'll talk about some other moments I really liked. Um, if you make it into the ship, the Heart of Gold, um, the, the ship is run by something called the Infinite Improbability Drive. Um, and if you want to go into that room, it says, do you really want to do this? And if you say yes, it says, I can tell you don't really want to. You stride away from it with a spring in your step, wisely leaving the drive chamber behind you. Telegrams arrive from well-wishers in all corners of the galaxy, congratulating you on your prudence and wisdom, cheering you up immensely. Uh, you eventually do get to use the infinite improbability drive, which results in one of five scenarios. They're all in random order, but you do have to beat all five. But you can also have the same scenario repeated, um, though they do give you an abridged version if you've already beaten it. But I'm like, man, this would be so hard to chart through. Like, if you're just a kid playing this, or even an adult playing this, that'd be really difficult. Did you see any of these? Did, I know you didn't make it that far, but I don't know if you looked up stuff. I, I looked at some of the different maps that were available through the BBC site, but uh, I didn't really get too, too deep into it. All right. So one of my favorite scenarios restarts the game from the beginning. Only you're Ford now and okay. you have to play the beginning out the same way with Arthur feeding the stray dog as you pass it as Ford. Um, oh, yeah. If, if you pass it as Ford, uh, you get this brilliant line. Fate cannot harm the dog for he has dined today. I thought that was great. <laughs> and the reason, too, that you have to uh, give this dog a sandwich is because that those words you say that start that galactic civil war that's just terrible, You there's a scenario based on that that you get to see that. Let's see. Let me find this one. Yes. It says, remember that dog you fed? That now brings rich re reward. The battle fleet plunges toward Earth and spots the dog, which appears to them as a gigantic monster cheerfully tucking into a cheese sandwich. The Vihergs and the Gigavunts are moved by this simple picture of happiness compared with the furious savagery of their own lives. They think back to a day when they used to relax over an odd cheese sandwich themselves, often at sunset after a hearty day working in the fields back in Verhergon and Gaguvia, and decide to return and rebuild their homes in a new spirit of harmony and cooperation. Grateful, <laughs> they offer to drop you back at the the heart of gold on the way home. After a brief 900 parsec trip, you are escorted into the transporter chamber of the warship. The transporter glows and your surroundings change. And so you're back. So yes, to end the civil war, because of weird time shenanigans that are quite improbable, you need to have fed that dog a sandwich. Makes sense in the context of the game. <laughs> yes, yes. There's another one where you end up inside a whale. Um, another great one where uh, there's a monster that wants to eat you, and uh, he chisels the names of all the people he's eaten on his wall. And the answer to this puzzle is to put the towel on your head, since uh, the monster is stupid, and it thinks that if you can't see it, it can't see you. Then while the towel is over your head, you need to pick up rocks from the ground and chisel your name on the wall of the dead. And then when you take the towel off, the monster wants to eat you and you point out, no, your name is already on the wall. And the monster says, oh, yes, of course, I must have already eaten you. And he decides to take a nap instead. 
it's such a specific tone it's going for. Obviously, it fits the tone of the books in the movie, I would assume. Yes, yes, it very much does. Um, at one like, point as well, a bunch of uh, it, this was like some random aside I got. I don't even think it was one of the one of the scenarios th- of the five, but it just says suddenly a team of front. Uh, my picture is a little bit smudged there. A team of beast hunters charges in intent on catching the beast for their zoo, mistaking you. Oh, yeah, it's part of this. OK, mistaking you for the beast. They fire stun guns at you wrap you in nets, and install you in a lovely little lair in the Fronerbdby National Zoo. Three months later, the error is discovered, but while your damage suit is pending in the Fronerbian court, the planet is invaded by bureaucratic pirates from Paladon 4, impressed into bondage for a 16-year filing and sorting mission on the so-called basement world of Sporla, in the lesser ma- magen- <laughs> I can't do all these names. In the lesser Magellanic cloud, you escape with the help of a tribe of nomadic asteroid painters. You develop a unique taste or talent for asteroid painting, gaining considerable fame throughout the cloud. A nickel ore deluxe is commissioned by his royal Gorpness Orbjfelk, the ruler of the 900 worlds of Gorp. But while working on this new masterpiece, your asteroid slips into a small passing black hole. Everything becomes dark and you wake up back on your ship. Quite the world tour there. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i just love the like the scope of these that's like yeah it's a quick aside uh it's two paragraphs long you were in in a zoo for months and then were a slave for 16 years and you became an asteroid painter and this is all just a quick aside you eventually make it back to your ship after all of these scenarios and uh you have a set amount of turns to deal with nukes launched at you and you have to go to the ship's controls and do more really specific stuff that would have taken me forever to work out without help and i can't imagine doing this without saves um getting sent back to the beginning of the game over and over after all of this, trying to work out what you do with this alien control panel. I mean, it's insane. Um, close to the end of the game, you you have had an item in your inventory the whole time that was no tea because you had no tea. And eventually you can make tea if you do a, a lot of, again, really specific things. And when you make tea and you pick up the tea, you drop no tea because now you have tea. But you can pick up no tea. So you have both tea and no tea. And uh, I think it was like the ship's computer congratulates you on being quite the philosopher if you have both tea and no tea at the same time. But this is pretty much uh, close to the end. You get to this legendary lost planet that uh, the captain of the ship was actually searching for. And uh, you the last text of the game, to spoil this like super old game, says you set one single foot on the ancient dust and almost instantly the most incredible adventure start, which you'll have to buy the next game to find out about. And uh, a sequel was actually started called Millaways, the restaurant at the end of the universe, uh, which would have continued from the end of that original game, but it had problems in development. Its development started in 1985 and was fully canceled by 1989. Infocom said this was because, uh, quote, there was no solid game design and nobody to program it and the backdrop of larger economic problems at Infocom. Though the beginning of this game was actually leaked in April of 2000. And I assume you can find that somewhere to play the beginning. Um, I imagine a franchise that has such adoring fans as Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has preserved something like that. But as far as I understand, it is very, very unfinished. Yep, no. Nope. Uh, so yeah, there's actually not a fan-made version of it. But yeah, you can still find that uh, the uh, remnants of those files from the sequel that never came to be. Um, and if if this sounds really interesting to you and you want to try this game for yourself, uh, it runs in pretty much every browser. It's on the BBC website, like the British news people. They have it archived on their website and free to play for anybody to just pop on and play. So I definitely think it's a, a fun way to spend an afternoon. Just a little thing. And we'll um, have it linked in the episode if we can. Oh, sweet. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it's not my, f- to, to kind of sum this up, it's not my favorite kind of game. I feel a little bit sad, though, that I feel like text-based games are kind of a thing of the past. It's funny because you'd think that with like our advanced like AI being able to recognize text, that like that format would kind of be better now. Because it, you could set up the AI to accept more phrases and things. Like Google can understand what you're asking, and like can even. Did you mean this? 
that sort of like technology would be like be more favorable like maybe the like format of like sitting there with like a blank line of sitting in a dark room might not be appealing but you'd think that that text format would kind of still work now you just have to find a better way to do it like frame it around something else because you'd be able to have it accept a lot more than before if that kind of makes sense like i said i feel like this is not a very appreciated genre these days but um it seems like the newest one that's not the ai is called the yog and that was a text-based game released for windows in may of 2013 and that is a uh one to four player choose your own adventure game that randomizes the story every time it's played It says players must decide how they will spend their time over the course of six weeks leading up to a supernatural storm. But yeah, it's a genre I know very, very little about, um, hence why I'm having to do all this looking things up. And it even says that um, it has like on Wikipedia, there's different groupings of text based adventure and uh, RPG games. And uh, one of the weirdest things I see on here that I had no idea was a thing I'm finding out about live is um play by email games did you know about that i've heard of things like that where um like play by mail games yeah it says it's it's a variant on play by mail games that that would exist seems slow so turn-based games played through mail a lot of people will do chess by mail well you're mail your letter out to your competitor and then they'll send their move back to you and it goes on for 27 years and then you finish one game of chess <laughs> yeah i cannot imagine this is like the earliest some of the earliest gaming stuff i mean it says this game diplomacy has been played by mail since 1963 it's probably the first game still <laughs> <laughs> yeah they'll they'll be wrapping up the first uh, the first ever session in 2030 i don't know <laughs> But it's cool to me uh, that there's people that enjoy this. And there's probably people that have played every single text-based adventure on this list. And I think that's super cool, if that's your thing. Um, what, do you, what do you think about uh, this as a genre, Daniel? I think it's cool. I think um, it would be useful, like I was saying, if it could understand more phrases rather than having to know like a really specific use of language. It'd be nice if there were more built-in buffers. Yeah, a lot of things that uh, so you, like, you gotta have like you you gotta keep in mind that Daniel and I can be stupid. <laughs> not even like stupid as much as it's like too smart kind of problem. Yeah. Maybe stupid in some contexts, but too smart in other contexts. Yeah, it's it's definitely difficult to uh, to when you're just gonna let people type to plan for every eventuality. Because like we've talked about with some of like the indie indie devs, it's like never know how somebody's going to play a game. So like you never know, like just because I play the game one way and don't find any bugs doesn't mean you play the game differently and find 400 bugs. The creator doesn't know how I'm going to play the game versus how you're going to play the game. Your language might be diff- like different than what I would use. Yeah, definitely. It can it can be difficult because it's like even just in trying to appreciate that poem. You know, I knew I was using a guide even that said you need to enjoy the poem. And so I was like, OK, I don't know quite what that means. So I say praise and it goes, I don't know that word. And I'm like, enjoy. And then it's like, or I said, appreciate. And it says, appreciate what? Yeah. And it's like, oh, OK, like it, it's just hard to slip into that for, for our 2022 brain to slip into that kind of way of thinking. But like Daniel said, it definitely could be uh, something that we could probably do better with today. And I think even just you'd avoid a lot of those problems designing it for people today that, you know, that don't know a lot of those, uh, a lot of those words, but, or a lot, a lot of the language. But I, I definitely think if you were going to make one today that you should keep in mind the people that have played all these games from the eighties, because there's a lot of games on this list that look pretty cool. So maybe, maybe this is something else I'll, I'll check out or, even if I don't want to completely solve it myself, I might watch a, a Let's Play of it because they do have those on YouTube. And uh, a lot of these are really seem like really neat stories. So uh, let us know if uh, I don't know if this is going to bring out some new people to the show. If you're really into Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I'm sorry that neither of us knows too much about it. But if you're super into text based adventure games and you want to see more of those from us, uh, tell us which ones you want to see. I mean, I wouldn't even mind having you on for an episode if you're really into that and listening to somebody talk about more of the history of it because it definitely is a genre with a rich history that i know very little about 
Definitely. And it definitely has that turn-based quality like we had our Chess to Final Fantasy episode and that's another link in the chain that led to a lot of the games we talk about. So Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. It's it's weird to see how all of this kind of went, you know, that it was like uh and and really it's not exactly text-based, but there are some browser-based games that I would say that are still popular today that uh, I would say is not a far throw from, from some of these things. So I think that's going to do it for us uh, for this episode. So much for uh, coming out to listen. And uh, if you want to play that game one more time, it is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Text-Based Adventure. And that is archived on the BBC's website. And it says a lot of these other text-based games are uh, hosted on Cambridge University's Phoenix main mainframe. I don't totally know what that is, but it seems like Cambridge University has actually preserved a lot of these old text-based adventure games. And maybe those are available to the public as well. So that would be an option for you if you want to try out some new uh some new uh, a new genre. All right, you can find me on Twitter at Chris underscore Harkey, H-A-R-K-E-Y, because that is my name. And you can find me on YouTube uh, on my channel Nihil, N-I-H-I-L, where I am probably playing a bunch of SRPGs like uh, Fire Emblem and Shining Force, and I'm always playing some sort of Shining Force something. So definitely pop over there. I would love to talk with you and hang out more. And you can find me on Twitter at Magar Mentions to see what I'm mentioning, or you can find us on turn at Turn by Turn Pod for our official show twitter account and um you can leave us wonderful reviews on apple podcasts and rate and subscribe and uh let us know what kind of episodes and topics you'd like to hear us talk about all right i think that'll do it for us today so uh i need uh for us to terminate the connection i need you to type end on your keyboard end game <laughs> <laughs> i i can't top that so have a great week everybody <laughs> i'm typing it's just not working and 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 bye everybody bye